Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring postmortem human survival and analytical idealism, the metaphysical philosophy. My guest is Bernardo Castrup, who has been a frequent guest on New Thinking Aloud. He is probably the foremost philosophical exponent of what he calls analytical idealism. He is the executive director of the Essentia Foundation and author of numerous books, including Decoding Jung's Metaphysics, Decoding Schopenhauer's Metaphysics, The Idea of the World, Why Materialism is Baloney, Rationalist Spirituality, and Dreamed Up Reality. Bernardo lives in the Netherlands, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Bernardo. It's a real pleasure once again to be with you. Always super fun to talk to you, Jeff, and instructive as well. Thank you. So, we're going to look at postmortem survival. And I gather from uh, your unpublished essay, I've had a chance to read it, will be in a new volume. I think it's called Consciousness Unbound, uh, probably re to be released later this year. I, I imagine uh, an important volume edited by Ed Kelly. Uh, who's a brilliant scholar in my estimation. Uh, so you're suggesting uh, to start out with that uh, the analytical idealistic philosophy that you and I have discussed many times on New Thinking Aloud uh, allows for uh, some possibility, some versions of postmortem survival, uh, having to do, I think, with, with the idea of a, of a larger self than our ego bound self after uh, death. I would go as far as to say that it allows for the only version that really, really matters. Everything else is a kind of story. Uh, the only version that is really significant uh, is the one allowed for by analytic idealism, I think, which is the survival of our subjectivity, that deepest sense of I-ness uh, that we have. And if I understand you correctly, you're, you're talking now about a kind of universal consciousness that we all partake of, the, the one eye that sees everything. According to Schopenhauer, right? The one eye of the world that sees through the eyes of every creature. Um, yes, I think our deepest subjectivity is not clothed in a narrative of personal identity. Our you can visualize it as how you would feel if you were in a perfectly dark and silent room and suddenly became completely amnesic. If you no longer remembered your name, where you were born, uh, you didn't have any memories, you just have the sense of subjectivity, of conscious presence, and you also don't have any perceptions. What is left when you remove memories, when you remove perceptions? What is left is this pure subjectivity, that sense of I-ness within which everything else unfolds as particular experiences, including the narrative of, the, of an individual self. So I think, you know, if I could if I could report from the other side after having died, what I would say is number one, oh darn, it's really me. <laughs> and, and number two, oh, I was not Bernardo all along. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think it's a beautiful vision. It seems consistent with a lot of uh, reports from the near-death experience, for example. But there's also a lot of data in uh, the fields of parapsychology and psychical research that refer to the survival uh, more closely identified with the ego. For example, cases of reincarnation where uh, a young child will have memories of, of a former life. It suggests that those memories are somehow being transferred. They're not being wiped out at death. I also don't think our memories are wiped out at all. Um, 
let, before I even answer this, let me first state that I am not closed to the possibility that some form of differentiated identity uh, persists. I don't think it will be the same form um, that uh, that we have now, because, you know, it's a dramatic change. You know, you have a physical body and then you don't have one anymore. It's naive to expect that um, it will be just your good old self. Uh, what age would you have then? Will you be your child self? Will you be the self that you had when you, the moment you died? I mean, all kinds of issues open. But uh, I am not close to the possibility of some form of subjective differentiation persisting. Now, the data you allude to, uh, which I take very seriously, and I think it is valid, I don't dismiss it at all. I actually, if, if I am pressed uh, against a wall and am required to say, do you, do you think it's true? I would say, yes, I think it's true. Um, that the data can be explained in other ways than the mere survival of the personal agency we are acquainted with right now. Um, when you wake up from a dream, you are no longer your dream self. Um, your core subjectivity is the same, but you no longer identify with that avatar you had within the dream. But you don't necessarily forget the dream. You can still remember the life story of that avatar. In the same way, I would bet that uh, the, the, the subject that will survive my death will remember my life. Um, and I would even go as far as to say that because I think death is the end of a dissociative process, the dissociative boundary sort of disappears, I would even go as far as to say that my memories become available to a much larger subjective context. And from there, they, the contents of what were my memories potentially can be picked up by a medium if mediums are, are, are truly, you know, uh, authentic. I would imagine that a medium could pick up on, on what were my memories and are now mental processes dispersed over a much wider field, which in a, in a sense, you know, it would help explain mediumship. How can a medium pick these things up? Well, because you know, those mental contents are now widespread in a layer of nature that escapes physical observation. But a medium, for one reason or another, is capable of picking these things out from this underlying field of, of subjectivity. The researcher, philosopher, Irvin Laszlo, uh, likes to think of it as the Akashic field, a, a kind of... Uh, uh, impersonal field, not related to individual ego consciousness, but it, within which all phenomena all, of, of the physical world, all thoughts and feelings are stored. I am very sympathetic uh, to that idea. Um, I think uh, once you check out from the current state of consciousness that we have now, I think um, the whole game of space and time has to be uh, reviewed. Um, because um, you know, evidence today, both from neuroscience and from physics, suggests very strongly that space and time is not an absolute scaffolding out there. It's a cognitive mode, so to say. It's a modality of experience, which Kant and Schopenhauer already maintained 250 years ago or 200 years ago. So no surprise there. Um, but once you uh, get rid of space and time, then there is no point in talking about the disappearance of anything or the appearance of anything, you know, appearance and reappearance in what timeline? It, it's not there anymore. So from that perspective, I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that every experience ever had by any entity throughout the history of the universe remains in existence outside of space-time because outside of space-time there is no popping into existence and popping out of existence if you know what i mean if it existed once then it exists i'm tempted to say always but that's the wrong word it exists in eternity outside of space and time the way you're describing it at the moment reminds me of uh, conversations I've had concerning what physicists call the block universe. That uh, all, uh, as Einstein put it, I think that the the distinction between past, present, and future is nothing more than a tenaciously persistent illusion. Are, is that what you're alluding to? 
But th this is, I, I was alluding even to more recent uh, um, evidence and, and theoretical speculations from the field of loop quantum gravity. Uh, but what you just referred to, surely it, 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 it it has been on the table since the first half of the, of the 20th century. Um, if Einstein's uh, relativity theory is correct, then our notion of time as something linear uh, in which there is an infinitesimal point called the present that traverses a linear trajectory, that view is off the table. And we know relativity theory is true. It has been experimentally confirmed multiple times. So what we have is... a as you said, a block universe, it's like a loaf of bread. Um, and if you slice that bread in, in, in a parallel line, then that's our traditional view of time. That parallel cut is a moment in time. But you can slice that bread in a diagonal as well. So what is past for you when you slice the bread like this may be present for someone who is observing it when it slices the bread in the diagonal. And the only conclusion you can arrive at is that the loaf of bread exists the slices are just a cognitive perspective. One of the paradoxes from that point of view is that the future is already fixed, it would seem. I mean, Einstein's world is completely determined from beginning to end, is it not? Well, determinism has a very tough time today because um, we know that at the microscopic level, quantum processes, insofar as we can understand and model them are not determined. Um, their statistical behavior is predictable, but their individual behavior is not. It seems to be random as far as we can say. And of course, randomness is just a very handy word to hide our ignorance of, of whatever is behind that. We say it's random when we don't know what's going on. That's basically the definition of randomness. What, what I wonder is if, if you are subscribing to a deterministic worldview, which I think Einstein, in fact, was. It's a tricky question. It's, uh, it's the same discussion as the discussion between determinism and free will. Um, it's the same tricky aspect when we try to think outside of space-time, when we say, well, if space-time don't exist, then, uh, then uh, the future is determined. Uh, and and uh, let, me, let me try to express why I think this is a tricky question. When we say that the future is already determined if reality is outside of space-time, we are making a logical fallacy. And the fallacy is the following. We are using the very thing we are denying to make our point. When I say the future already exists, I am using the tools of space and time in my language when I make that statement. While the premise is that space-time don't exist, so you cannot use that tooling. Um, and, and the problem is that if we don't use that tooling, we can't open our mouths and say anything. There is nothing to be said because we think in spatial and temporal terms. Our verbs have tenses. Uh, we separate uh, uh, the objects of our linguistic manipulation into subject and object, past and future here and there. So we cannot reason outside space-time. So by acknowledging that space-time is just a, a cognitive category, uh, we cannot, we should not run into the fallacy of then trying to cognize what's going on outside space-time because that cognitive category is our intellect. We cannot reason beyond that. It sets the tone for our reasoning. What I would say is that the best we can say is that what we see within space and time is a reflection of something eternal. And therefore, it's not ultimately true. It's a projection, a reflection, a, a shadow of something not cognizable, which it, it exists outside our cognitive environment. Um, so it's not ultimately true, <clears throat> but it can be a good approximation. Uh, it can be penultimately true if you know what I mean. It can be as true as we can get in our language. So what I would say is that um, there are such things as telos, as meaning, as uh, moral responsibility, as choice. Uh, these things exist, not ultimately, 
they don't exist ultimately because they presuppose space-time. But we are locked within space-time in our reasoning. So it's valid to talk about these things, telos, meaning, uh, uh, choice. Uh, they are reflections of something that we cannot cognize directly and therefore we cannot speak of directly. Uh, but they reflect something true outside this. And again, I'm repeating myself, we should not fall into the logical fallacy of starting by rejecting space-time and then proceed to reason from space-time. <laughs> Don't do that. It doesn't make sense to do that. Well, it's a paradox. And it, it strikes me that when we're talking about uh, post-mortem survival of the human, now we're talking about a paradox within a paradox. Uh, it, it gets very tricky. Uh, there, there's some interesting case histories uh, that I'd like to share with you. One of them, I have done a previous interview with Vernon Nepion. We call it the chess game from beyond the grave. But it's a, a wonderful example from Europe in which a, a medium was asked, could you locate a, a deceased grandmaster in chess who would be willing to play a game with a living grandmaster? Because Victor Korknoy, who was a living chess grandmaster, agreed to this. And a, the medium, who had no advanced chess skills, found apparently a a deceased chess player, a fellow named Maroxi, who had died in the 1950s, I believe was Hungarian, and, and was well known in the annals of chess. And they actually played a game. Korknoy won, but in, in winning the game, he, he said, you know, I was playing against somebody who had uh, enormous chess skill. And further analysis showed that the personality of the original uh, Meroxi, the way he played chess, his personality came through in, in the game, which is now on record. So it would seem as if uh, the skill, not just the memory, but the actual skill of playing chess somehow uh, survived as well and was transmitted through this uh, Swedish medium. I will reply with a story of my own. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, a few years ago, I was experimenting with psychedelics. Um, and I am a mediocre chess player. ELO rating 1800 or something, 850 maybe. My best was 2000 years ago. Um, and I, during the re-entry of the trip, you know, you have a psychedelic experience um, and then you begin to come back and, and then you remember who you are, you know, who you think you are and, you know, you sort of get your bearings again. But your mind is not still fully reconstituted. You're not fully dissociated again yet. Uh, you're still sort of open to a notion of mental activity that uh, normally we are totally insulated from. Um, and I and because I've done these, you know, psychedelic experiences as part of a study program, <laughs> research activity, um, one of the experiments I set up for myself was to play a few games of online chess during that window of half an hour when you are ready enough back to be able to type on a keyboard and, and see what's going on, but not back enough that you, your, your normal self is fully reconstituted. And I played three games of, uh, of um, it was not blitz, those were rapid games, 10 minutes for each player. And these games last an average of 15 minutes uh, online against unknown opponents. And uh, what I immediately found striking is that uh, I did not calculate anything, which I normally do. Normally I calculate five, six, seven moves ahead. And I was playing in a completely intuitive manner. I, 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 I felt I don't need to calculate. I looked at the board and, oh, I know what to play. Don't ask me why. I just know that this is the move. And I played probably the three most fantastic, brilliant games of chess I ever played in my life. And I did win uh, all the, the games. Now, um, the computer selects your opponent based on your own ELO rating. So I was about 1800, so I would play somebody which is 1800 something as well, maybe nine, 1900, uh, uh, um, but not, not somebody much better than that. So, okay, I didn't win from the world champion. Um, but uh, my subjective experience was amazing because 
the game unfolded in such a way that was not calculated by me. And yet I was playing all the right moves. So there is something about reduced dissociation, which is what psychedelics do. They sort of push down your brain activity quite significantly, especially around the region we, we associate with the ego, the default mode network. Um, there is something about that state that allows us to access not only memories, not only perceptions or images, but also skills that uh, normally we are insulated from. Um, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, I, and uh, I will say something more, um, not in this respect uh, to the evidence, but just you know, for, for us to put all cards on the table. It is very iffy to try to derive from the moves played uh, in a chess game who the player was. Um, yes, players have specific styles. Karpov had a completely different style than Kasparov. But you can identify these styles when you look at an entire database of games played by that person, and then you can feel the smell of the player, if you know what I mean. But when you are looking at a single game, and there's a lot of chess theory. Openings are standardized. End games are standardized. Uh, uh, players don't even go anymore now to certain end games because everybody knows how to play that. So you are left with the middle game to try to derive the personality of the player. And you can do that if you have a large database of games. So if this medium had played, I don't know, 100 games, then I would say, well, there is some confidence about what the player's style is. But from one game, we, we can't pin down. We can't pin that down, Jeff. <laughs> well, in this case, my understanding is, Bernardo, that because Meroxi had died in 1954, he was playing a, a style that was common at the time of his death. And uh, this chess match took place decades later in, in which the moves of chess had advanced a great deal. Openings are still the same to this day. Um, I, I tell you, the, the biggest advancement and change in chess has happened in the 21st century because of the advance of uh, chess engines, computers that play a lot better than humans. And they have taught us moves that we would never have played before. Very counterintuitive intuitive moves like advancing the corner pawn very early in the game, advancing the A or, or, or the H pawn very early in the game. Humans never did that for 200 years. And now everybody's doing that because the engines taught us that it makes sense. Uh, I don't know when your, your report, uh, um, the events uh, took place, but you know, from the late 1800s to the time of Kasparov, uh, until the late 1990s. Uh, yes, there are subtle differences in style. There are certain lines that were played earlier and are no, are no longer played because experience tells us these are no, tend to be losing lines. Uh, but it's, it's quite difficult to pin down even the time uh, based on one game alone. I would say, in principle, it is possible to pin down a certain style, but you need a set of games. It's, uh, it, it's too iffy to try to take uh, extract conclusions from one game. I'm sure I have played in my chess history a game that, uh, you know, in my moments of random brilliance that somebody would look at and say, well, maybe Fisher played this. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I gather from the tone of our conversation that that you are taking uh, a, an appropriately skeptical point of view towards uh, some of the evidence that's been brought forward uh, in favor of human survival. I, I think the interesting thing in the events you are reporting to me, and I think there are there is a very interesting thing. The interesting thing is the medium could play competent chess against a grandmaster. This is what matters. Let's not lose sight from that. That is very interesting. And I believe that totally because I have had my own inexplicable experience of playing chess by pure intuition and winning three games. Um, but we sort of do a disservice to ourselves when we try to make it more spectacular by saying, well, it was Victor Korshnoi, whatever, whoever the player was, based on one game. That, that's where we lose it. You know, we lose sight of what is really significant here. 
Let me bring up another example and uh, see how this fits in with uh, analytical idealism. There's uh, a case that took place in the United Kingdom, a man named George Chapman, who had been in the military and he worked for the fire department, uh, not highly educated. Uh, he, he was a fireman and they're sitting around, they have time on their hands, they began experimenting with the Ouija board. And uh, over time, it, what came through was a, a spirit identifying himself as an ophthalmological surgeon named Dr. William Lang, who had died some 10 years earlier. And Lang communicated that he had had a, a past life connection with this fireman named George Chapman, and that he was now going to work with George Chapman. And George Chapman became a healer, and Lang the, was the spirit controller of, of George Chapman. And uh, this went on for 60 years until Chapman's death in the year 2006. So roughly from 1946 to 2006, Chapman uh, ex manifested the spirit of Dr. William Lang so perfectly that Lang's own family members uh, felt that it was authentic and actually hired Chapman to hold weekly seances for them. That went on for 10 years with Chapman's uh, former colleagues. I mean, excuse me, William Lang's former colleagues in the medical profession who who felt that this was quite authentic. So here you have a, a case that was ongoing for decades in which uh, an apparently deceased individual manifested himself through one particular medium. And in addition, to convincing them of his identity, he affected many uh, healings along the way that were reported for decades in the, uh, a publication called Psychic News, which was a British spiritualist publication. Let me start by confessing to my ignorance. I, 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 I'm not a student of, uh, of Psy, so you should take everything I say with a bag of salt because I'm speaking from ignorance and not from from knowledge um, having made this disclaimer I will comment as far as I can um, 60 years is a long period of time um, if the family of the deceased person endorses the case I think that's very impressive these were the people who who knew uh, the person in question so on face value I would take this very seriously uh, I don't think this is dismissible what frustrates me often is um, that people quote cases from the 1900s or from the very early 20th century and then there is always that question in my mind well why do you need to go so far back when there weren't reliable records to bring out a case w why is it not happening today in the 21st century now, you just told me of something that happened uh, into the early 21st century. So I respect that. I think your, your choice of case is, is, is very wise. <laughs> you have insulated yourself against my standard <laughs> type of criticism. Um, is it possible that um, there is differentiated subjectivity surviving physical death. I, I don't think it is impossible a priori. I'm open to that. But I think we have to also remain open to the other possible models, uh, the other possible explanations for the evidence that we that we think are, are um, is, is solid and reliable. Um, a skill is something that, look, um, let me let me be concrete. We have these uh, very well documented cases of acquired savant, people who who suffer lightning strike or some other form of injury like a trauma to the head because of a car accident or a baseball bat or even uh, the progression of dementia. We have cases of uh, acquired savant because of the progression of dementia. And these are people who from one day to the other, because of some form of brain function impairment or damage, manifest a, with a, an amazing degree a skill they didn't have before. There's a case of somebody who, after being hit in the head by a baseball and suffering a concussion, uh, could remember every single day of his life for decades. You could tell him a date years in the past, and he would tell you what happened in that day, what the weather was like, what the temperature was like, what he did, you know, at every time, at every moment of the day. 
this is so an injury has unlocked prodigious um, memory skills. We have other cases for artistic skills, people who can suddenly paint with tremendous competency from, from one day to the other or compose uh, uh, songs that, uh, and play instruments that they couldn't before, do mathematical calculations in a purely intuitive but extremely fast and accurate manner. So there is something about impairing our normal state of consciousness that opens us up to what appears to be an uh, uh, untapped pool of skills. Um, of course, it raises all kinds of questions. Why aren't we naturally uh, in contact with those skills? Well, I would suggest that many of them do not have a bearing on survival. Um, you don't need to be a great mathematician to survive a tiger in the African or in the Asian jungle. Uh, you don't need to remember everything that happened in your day 20 years ago to survive today. Uh, you don't need to be an artist to survive. So evolution would not have shaped us to access that pool, but accidents apparently have that effect. So that he unlocked, the, the person in question unlocked uh, um, skills that could not be explained otherwise, I would be tempted to model according to my own analytic idealism as a an impairment to the dissociative process that characterizes our normal standard state of consciousness. Um, now, I am intrigued uh, with the, the, the fact that the family of the person also recognized personality traits uh, for a period of decades in recent times. I find that intriguing and I cannot easily dismiss that. No. When you talk about the dissociative process, uh, and we've discussed this earlier, it's worth going into it in, in more detail. Uh, if one forms an ego, the, the, the basic necessity, I think, is that there has to be a boundary, a perimeter, that uh, an inside and an outside, a membrane, so to speak. And you've suggested that the, the human body itself is uh, the external appearance of that dissociative process. But it, it dawns on me that there could be other uh, ways in which the dissociative process might manifest itself besides a, a physical body. For example, in, in the esoteric literature, we have the idea of an etheric body, an astral body, a mental body. That there, there could be other expressions of the dissociative process that would be more consistent with the uh, data uh, of survival. It is possible. I don't think this can be, I don't think there is anything in analytic idealism that would preclude this possibility a priori. Um, I think the important question, because we often ask the question, what could be the case? Uh, it's a very tempting question. And, and the answer is usually, well, a whole lot of things could be the case. The, the interesting question is what do we have reasons to believe might be the case. I mean, I cannot eliminate the possibility of the flying spaghetti monster. It may, it may exist, but do we have reasons to believe that it exists? Uh, well, probably not. Um, but what, and I understand you, what you're saying is that in this case, we might have, might very well have reasons to give credence to the possibility that there are other forms of dissociation in the fabric of the universe that we did not evolve to pick up through our five senses. And uh, and I think that's a coherent uh, position uh, to hold. Again, I'm not a student of the Psy literature, so I, 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 can't, I, don't, I do not have authority to say, well, we have good reasons to entertain that possibility. You are in a much better position than I ever will be to, to make that statement. But I would take your, state, your statement seriously if you say yeah, we do have uh, uh, enough reasons to entertain that possibility. Um, look, we, there is no reason to, and this is something that is dawning on science over the last 10 years. We have no reason to think that the world we see in the form of matter and space-time that that's the thing in itself, that's the world as it is in itself. No, our, our sense organs have evolved to provide us with information to survive, and they will provide that information in whatever form facilitates survival the most. They are not made to give us a, a transparent window into the truth of what is out there. In other words, our sense organs are a dashboard. They are not a transparent windshield. It's a set of dials. Uh, uh, that allows us to survive. They convey 
actionable information about the world, but they don't present the world to us as it is in itself. So we have evolved a certain set of dials in a dashboard to pick up what's relevant for our survival. And of course, those instruments on our dashboard will not pick up on what is irrelevant. Why are we going to spend metabolic energy on processing information about the world that has no bearing on our, on our, on our survival? So it is in principle entirely coherent to say that there are dissociative processes going on in the world out there that we do not pick up in our dashboard, uh, which we call the material universe, because they do not have a bearing on our survival. For, for some reason, there is no commerce of energy uh, between us and them. So we vote to ignore them, and yet they might be there. That's a, that's a coherent position to take. As I recall, uh, you also described the idea that the these dissociative processes, uh, and I like to think of them somehow as membranes, uh, could be porous. Uh, they don't have to be completely hermetically sealed airtight. Uh, I mean, our sense organs are a form of porosity, I suppose, but there can be other forms of, of porosity that, as I recall, you you've suggested that could account for extrasensory perception, remote viewing, uh, psychic functioning uh, among the living. Yeah, no process in nature is ideal. Uh, no process in nature is perfect from an idealized perspective. So no dissociative membrane uh, will be perfect in the sense of providing total insulation between our in internal mental life and the mental processes that are out there. We have evolved windows into the activity that is out there, and those are our sense organs. Um, there have been benefits uh, uh, for, for our having evolved this way, um, but I think it is not only theoretically, but empirically naive to think that our dissociative boundaries are ideal and perfect. Clearly they are not. I have, uh, I have seen enough of what I'm forced to call anecdotal evidence in my own life and the life of people very close to me uh, to conclude beyond reasonable doubt that our the dissociative boundaries are porous. They are most definitely porous. We pick up on information um, that uh, do not come to us via our sense organs. When I was, um, when I was a kid, and by a kid, I mean, I don't know, eight or nine years old, um, my family, um, the Portuguese side of my family, my family is Portuguese Danish. So the Portuguese side of my family had a big family secret, uh, which I honor to this day. So I will not tell you what that secret uh, was or is because the people involved don't. I, I personally find it banal. <laughs> I don't understand why it's a secret. <laughs> I would be completely comfortable opening it to the world, but uh, it's not my call to make. So the family had a secret. And my one day, I, I my mother was saying, was telling me not to do something, and then she said, uh, and I can't tell you the reasons why I don't want you to do that because it's a secret. She told me, an eight-year-old, nine-year-old kid, and then I proceeded to tell her exactly what that secret was, and my mother turned blue. She was her first reaction was, who told you this? So she wanted to know the person who had revealed the big secret to an eight-year-old kid. And I don't know how long it took for her to believe, if she believes it, <laughs> maybe to this day she doesn't believe it, that nobody told, it, told that to me. I just It just popped in my head. When she told me there is a secret and I can't reveal it to you, the secret was just in front of me. <laughs> I saw the movie, <laughs> know what I mean? and I proceeded to describe to her in detail what that secret was, and not as a guess. I knew it, and I knew that I knew it. I, I couldn't tell myself as a kid how I knew it, but it was the most natural thing in the world to me. I knew that I knew it, and I just told her, <laughs> and that, guess what? <laughs> it was exactly in detail what the secret was. Uh, my girlfriend has this uh, quite regularly. Uh, she, she knows things that sometimes I'm like, how the hell did you know this? I, I relate some of that in my book on Jung. Um, so yes, the, you bet the boundaries are porous. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you brought up Jung, uh, because Jung, uh, in his Red Book, 
seems to suggest that uh, the collective unconscious, which he has explored through the process of uh, active imagination, contains the archetypes of, uh, of the psyche, but also contained, according to Jung, the actual dead. Not archetypes, typal images, but the images of the deceased that he believed he interacted with. I've actually conducted a few interviews now with a Jungian scholar, Stephanie Stevens, who goes into this in, in quite a bit of detail. Jung seemed to maintain that the, the realm of the dead, what the Tibetans call the Bardo Plains, is the, the collective unconscious. Uh, that would seem to be consistent with your uh, philosophy also, wouldn't it? It would. Um, I think it is. Yeah, I, I don't want to, un to antagonize where you're coming from. Uh, but Jung has indeed often spoken about the dead and, and, and uh, the service that he felt compelled to provide to the dead. And he had spoken about it throughout his career to the very end, to his, yeah, apparently autobiography whether it's really an autobiography anyway um so there is no question about that he always alluded um to the dead and the service he had provided to the dead um but what did he mean by that did he mean by that that he felt compelled to answer the questions that the dead formulated and couldn't answer themselves did he feel compelled compelled to honor the natural progression of certain traditions like the aura catena uh, or did he mean that the dead continue to exist in the form that they existed when they were alive uh, uh, as diamonds of the collective unconscious i personally cannot make that call very sharply based on jung's writings he was a very intuitive writer he didn't use terms in a self-consistent way um, he, he apparently contradicted himself. He, he didn't really contradict himself, but he gave that impression. If you'd read him quite literally, like, uh, like you would read an analytic philosophy treatise, if you read him like that, he contradicts himself all over the place, uh, because he was an intuitive writer. So what I personally take from that, and, and, and by the way, I feel compelled in a similar way. I, I feel a what he describes, I think I feel that too, uh, uh, the, the obligation, the responsibility to honor the dead in the form of giving continuity uh, to, the, to the cognitive arch that has started with them and is going through us and will end at some point in the future, if at all. Um, so I, I feel compelled to honor him, to honor Schopenhauer, to honor the tradition that they both and myself are a part of. So in that sense, I'm honoring the dead. But that is the case whether Jung and Schopenhauer continue to exist as individual agencies or not, because their thought, the questions they raised, those persist in the realm of the dead, whether they continue to be individual subjects or not, if you know what I mean. Uh, it is that line of thinking and feeling, it's those questions that were asked uh, that to me is the realm of the dead. Well, I, and that's fair. I think that uh, people can interpret Jung in, in many different ways. I do know that uh, several people, in addition to Stephanie Stevens, seem to think that Jung got in touch with his sole purpose, that his entire psychology, all of his theoretical work was communicated to him in this act of imagination uh, state, and that in addition to him teaching the dead, it came to him from dead teachers. Well, th there is no question now that uh, Jung's nearly entire psychology has uh, um, has arisen from uh, um, from experience from from visionary experience and not from uh, steps of rational deduction that's not how he went about it the, the the rationalization came after the fact and we know that since 2009 when the the red book was published and, and, and everything in Jungian psychology nearly everything, maybe not absolutely everything, but a lot can be traced back to the Red Book. But if you look at the entities that he, in his visionary experience, talked, experience talked to, it's very difficult to, to say that uh, those were individuals that once lived on Earth. 
um, he spoke to giants. He spoke to, to flying human beings. Philemon started as a flying human being and evolved into Ka, the Egyptian body soul, so to say. So if you go through the Red Book, yes, he spoke to diamonds of the collective unconscious, more or less dissociated mental processes in the collective unconscious that had a perspective of their own. But I think it goes too far to say that those were people who once were alive because you cannot map them one to one to human beings, uh, in, in, you know, one of the most instructive um, um, agents uh, in Jung's visions was a snake, a black snake. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and these figures morphed. They changed shapes. Uh, uh, if you read the Red Book, those figures morph into other figures. So, yeah, but I, I'm comfortable saying they are diamonds of the collective unconscious. They are, you know, slightly dissociated mental activity in the collective unconscious that have a particular point of view, uh, a particular prejudice, if you want. Um, But I think it's not tenable to map that onto the souls of people who actually lived before. Uh, That would be an interesting discussion to have directly with Stephanie Stevens, who thinks that there are some examples that do map uh, on, including Jung's own father. But... uh, that, no point for us to pursue that discussion now. I'm much more interested in looking at how the uh, philosophical perspective that you espouse, analytical idealism, might allow for these things. And, and you're already describing semi-autonomous entities that are part of the collective unconscious, uh, but which we would not think of as deceased individuals. So that sort of uh, suggests one possibility. And I think if if I pushed you, you would probably admit a fully deceased surviving individual is also another possibility there. It is a possibility. It's not something I can rationalize away. Uh, no. But again, I would insist on the question is not what can be. The question is, what do we have reasons to believe likely, to believe not only possible, but, you know, uh, um, Probable. Of course, we have uh, a 140 year history of the journals and proceedings of the Society of Psychical Research that looked into this question since 1882. And, and for the decade or two before that, even a, a additional research. Uh, another example would be Frederick Myers, who wrote the great book, Human Personality and Survival of Bodily Death. It was published posthumously. Uh, after Myers died in 1901. But then people thought, surely if anybody is going to communicate after his death, it would be Myers. So many automatic writers reached out to try and communicate with Myers, people in different continents, England, in- India, the United States. And it appeared as if Myers was expressing willful intent to prove his existence by creating what are known as the cross correspondences, where it would be like a puzzle. And the puzzle only made sense when you put the pieces together and the pieces came through these mediums and on different continents who would get messages in automatic writing and report them to the Society for Psychical Research. This went on for actually a period of about 30 years where uh, these messages would come through and it, it appeared as if there was one intention working through multiple mediums. Look again, I, I'll disclaim everything by, by, by making my ignorance <laughs> very clear. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a student of the field, um, but I will... Uh, believe you because i think i have every reason in the world in the world to to take your view of this uh, very seriously so i take it very seriously i think that the important part of what you said is that there seems to be an intentional attempt on the part of the diseased to prove that he still exists as a a, a personal agency uh, that is intriguing and the reason i say that is intriguing is because some of the uh, post-mortem uh, evidence I have had the opportunity to look at. I, I've read a book a few years ago by an Icelandic scholar 
who I had the pleasure to meet in person, but his name escapes me now. Erlander uh, Haraldson. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, he ha- he wrote a book, I think, ten years ago, maybe fifteen years ago, um, in which he he, he it, it, it's an amazing compilation of what we must call anecdotal evidence, but uh, anecdotal evidence that deserves being taken seriously. Anecdotal because it was not collected under laboratory or controlled conditions. So I don't mean any prejudice by using the word anecdotal, I'm just differentiating it from evidence collected under controlled conditions. So I take that book very seriously, but I would go as far as to say that 100% of that can be explained as the mental content of the diseased uh, 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 enduring in some uh, transpersonal field of mentation that can be picked up not only by mediums, but by you and me in certain states of consciousness. Um, So the the, the only warning I would provide is that a lot of the evidence, well, I don't know what a lot, but some of the evidence that is used um, to argue for the survival of personal agency can be equally or better explained uh, by 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 the hypothesis that it is our mental contents that survive and are spread around in a broader field when we pass away, um, not us as agencies. It's my memories, my experiences, even my skills. Uh, that of course they will go nowhere. Where 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 are they going to go? <laughs> Mind is, the, in my view, is the ground level of reality. So they they have nowhere to go. They will persist, and and because of the porosity of a dissociative boundary, some of us, maybe all of us, under certain circumstances, can pick them up precisely because they are no longer insulated by a dissociative boundary. So in a sense, it is precisely the hypothesis that you are no longer a dissociated agent that accounts for the data, because only by that means uh, uh, are the experiences of what was before an alter, a dissociated alter, only by the end of the dissociation, the end of the personal agency, do those experiences become available uh, uh, in a broader context and amenable to being picked up uh, by someone else. Um, But I admit that what I just said does not account for an apparently deliberate attempt to 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 provide evidence that there is the survival of the agency itself the individual agency itself so you're suggesting what the the data you alluded to which i'm not aware of i would take that more seriously than the data the small amount of data i did have the opportunity to look at for instance in the work of haraldson because i think if anything could differentiate between now, mental contents surviving and the personal agency surviving, if anything could make that differentiation, it would be a deliberate attempt to show that uh, individual uh, mental agencies survive because it's only an individual mental agency that could make that deliberate attempt. attempt. Everything else would be just the flow of nature. Well, let's suppose hypothetically a deliberate attempt was made and uh, it's controversial. Every bit of evidence for human survival has been challenged at many different levels from many different types of critics. But if we assume for the moment that uh, th- we consider this a valid attempt, how would you then explain it? How would I accommodate that within analytic idealism? I would say uh, dissociation is hierarchical and our um perceptual uh, apparatus, our senses, our sense organs, our eyes, ears, uh, nose, did, in, did not evolve to pick out the, the meta levels of that dissociation uh, because they may not have a bearing on our ability to survive. Um, the, the, the level of that hierarchy of dissociation that does have a bearing on my ability to survive correspond to your physical body. So that's what I evolved to pick out. And I don't pick out the root of the plant you are, because that root is under the soil, if you know what I mean. Uh, and that's the metaphor Jung used. Uh, he compared us to, you know, the the flowering of a plant in the spring, which dies in the autumn. And we think, okay, 
it's over, it's gone. But actually, the real plant survives invisible under the under the ground and, and sprouts another shoot uh, next year in the spring. And he, he uses this metaphor in the very beginning, the opening of his autobiography. So I'm I'm open to that possibility. Why am I not? outright uh, married with that possibility because again i think it's not about what could be it's about what we have reasons to take as plausible and unlikely and you are better equipped equipped to know whether we have those reasons than i am one approach to this problem was expressed by uh, a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Bernard Carr, who, as I recall, was one of your faculty members. And when you got your uh, recent uh, doctoral degree in philosophy, and, and Bernard Carr is a, a proponent of the idea of uh, hyperspace models of consciousness, that uh, if we look at the mathematics of hyperspace, we can envision um, that uh, people might survive. There could be a somewhere, not in uh, four-dimensional space-time, but uh, the somewhere could be mapped mathematically as, as being in hyperspace. Would, would that be consistent with uh, analytical idealism? Absolutely. And not only that, I would I would say uh, Bernard's work is one of the most important, important and, and, and promising uh, out there. Um, I hope and wish that he dedicates his time to to elaborating on that. It's not finished. Uh, he did. He did. Not, I mean, there's a lot of work still to do to really close uh, his model. Um, but um, the, the, the gist of his model is that we will only understand mind if we understand space-time. Because as Schopenhauer said, uh, space-time is the principium individuus Jonas. And by that he meant something totally other than Jung's individuation. Uh, Schopenhauer's point is that you need space-time in order to differentiate one thing from another. Because one thing is just other than another if they occupy two different positions in space or if they are in the same point in space but at different moments in time and if you don't have space time then everything is one there is on, only unity so uh, bernard's work accounts or attempts to account for our uh, individual selves what appears to be our individual selves account for our dreams because in his model dream space is a part of space-time hyperspace hyperspace time if you will it's just another region of space time in which we have dream experiences and those other regions um, can be trafficked it can be you, you can move in those other regions according to laws that are not the laws of physics that apply to to this uh, right now um, I think it's very promising um, and I and I hope he he develops that further. And yes, it it is entirely not only entirely consistent with analytic idealism. I think it would help address what is perhaps the weakest point of analytic idealism, which is to provide a explicit and fully analytic account of the mechanism of dissociation. Because today we have an empirical account of it. We know it happens. You know, we can do brain imaging of people suffering from dissociative identity disorder, and we know they actually have a disorder. They are not pretending because, you know, dissociation looks like something identifiable in a brain scanner. Um, and a whole lot of recent research proves that dissociation actually happens. So we know it happens. We don't need to prove the plausibility of it through analytic models, because whether we can model it or not, we know it darn happens, okay? It's, it, nature is showing us, putting under our nose as it happens. Um, but it would be comforting uh, and pleasing to the intellect if we had a fully explicit analytic account of that mechanism, because it's not only inferential isolation, which is what I leverage in my model, but I, I acknowledge there is more to it than pure inferential isolation. And I think the way we will finally have an analytic account for how myself can be the same self that is looking at me behind your eyes, how it can be the same self and yet appear to be different how can we provide an analytic account of this? I think the way to do it is to explore hyperspace time. And that's exactly what Bernard is doing. So I would say his work is very important for, for the adoption of analytic idealism. Because you see, the problem of why, my, why I seem to be different than you is Schopenhauer's principle of individuation. Um, I can play chess against myself. I can sit on one side of the board, make a move, 
stand up, go to the other side of the board and go into that mode of, okay, now I'm playing black, make a move, stand up, go to the black, to the white side, settle into that mindset of, okay, now I'm playing white, make a move. So I can play against myself. And we don't find it a contradiction. We, do, we don't think it's a paradox. It's just me. It's just that I am moving in space time as I make each move. So there is no problem in saying that it's the same player on both sides. The problem is you are there now and I'm here now. Know what I mean? So how can I be the same thing as you? Because, you know, we are occupying different positions in space, but at the same time, the problem is time. So if we could say you are in one timeline, I am in, in, in another, but we are the same self in different timelines interacting with each other across timelines, then we have an analytic account for dissociation, for how the same self can appear to be many. And I think that's the promise of Bernard's work. It is to provide that analytic, explicit model for how oneself can be you and me and him at the same time. Bernardo, that was very elegantly put. I agree with you, as a matter of fact, on the significance of Bernard Carr's work. And uh, obviously, we could uh, continue this discussion for hours. It's a fascinating conversation. I hope that we do continue for years, uh, as a matter of fact. But uh, for now, let me say it's been a great pleasure once again to be with you. I'm delighted to be able to share your thoughts with our viewing audience. I want to encourage our viewers to check out your newest book, Decoding Jung's Metaphysics. And uh, I look forward to uh, having you back on New Thinking Aloud many more times in the future. It's always a very great pleasure and a sincere pleasure uh, to talk to you. So count on me. I'll be here as often as you want. <laughs> and for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.